meeting you and talking to you about uh, research that is going on. For this morning, um, it's a privilege for me this time to visit you together with two of my colleagues, Dr. Rink and Dr. Khanna, who will also be presenting at this forum. So what I have decided to do is uh, present a summary of where we are coming from in the context of the project that we have been running for the last uh, 13, 14 years or so, where we are coming from and where we are heading, and to draw uh, the picture in broad strokes so we can wrap our mind around the entire project and see how we can leverage the strengths that each of you have to take this very interesting project, which I hope you find uh, forward. So the topic of my discussion, as you see, would be to try to project palm tocotrienols uh, for uh, possible therapeutic uh, purposes against stroke. Now, stroke, as is in most countries, also in Malaysia, as well as in the United States, uh, is obviously a major problem. And the problem is not only major because people die uh, you know, uh, because of stroke, but also because they survive. And uh, it's a huge cost to society. And uh, there's this very interesting concept of secondary prevention. So it is not just that, oh, well, uh, I wish I did not have stroke. Many of us, unfortunately, end up having stroke. And there is a great opportunity for secondary prevention. And, and I'll come back to this topic uh, in due course. Now, of course, uh, this is uh, recent data from Global Data, um, from the American Stroke Association, European Stroke Association, Center for Disease Control in the U.S. So if you look at the 2010 market of, uh, 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 for stroke therapeutics, it is supposed to quadruple uh, between 2010 to 2018. There's a massive uh, business opportunity. You know, this is an MPOC meeting. Uh, so therefore, I would also, as we discuss science, try to... Uh, also address the impact of uh, the science that we're discussing. Now, stroke in general are of two types, and uh, generally speaking, 80% uh, of it, uh, as you see uh, to the uh, right of your screen, is ischemic stroke, and about 17 or 20% of it, roughly, is hemorrhagic stroke. Now, everything I'm going to discuss today uh, is about ischemic stroke, which covers roughly 80% of all stroke there is. Now, if you look at, uh, you know, where the field stands now, the fact that palm tocotrienols are an extremely potent neuroprotective agent was reported by our group in the year 2000, at the turn of the millennium. And at that time, uh, you know, neuroprotection and palm tocotrienol was not uh, a known feature. If you look at the literature between 2000 and 2013, the last 13 years, um, I'm pleased to see that the top two most cited papers in the entire tocotrienol literature from 2000 to 2013 has to do with neuroprotection and stroke. As you see here, if you go to Google Scholar, you will see that at least in the five of our works are cited over 100 times, and, and uh, one being this review that I wrote on tocotrienols, vitamin E beyond tocopherols. There's a big controversy in the literature about whether tocotrienol is even a vitamin E, and, uh, you know, there has been uh, an old-school way of thinking that it is not, and there is a new-school way of thinking, as I would say, that it is. And we address some of that in this particular review uh, in tocotrienols, vitamin E, uh, beyond tocopherols. And AOCS, the American Oil Chemist Society, picked up on it and actually did a book uh, on that for which I wrote the foreword uh, called exactly the same, tocotrienols, vitamin E, beyond tocopherols. So I would recommend uh, those of you that are interested in this field, although the book is a few years old now to take a look at this version of the book, which was the original version. If you go to you know, Google, there are over 100,000 pages talking about tocotrienol and stroke. And all of this development happened in the last 10 years. Massive uh, visibility. So, so it's our responsibility, really, to make this credible, to make sure we are disseminating the right type of inf information, to make sure we are pushing forward evidence-based medicine. Of course, promotion is important, but promotion has to be supported by properly vetted scientific content. So that sense of responsibility mu must be appropriately carried. If you look at this time period, 2000 to 2013, uh, there's a sharp rise, uh, obviously, in the neuroprotective literature. And uh, neuroprotection alone, uh, 1,675 times uh, in a cited of tocotrienol. And as you see now, uh, each year now, about in excess of 300. When we started, there was like 10, 10, 10 citations a year. That is when we started in 2000. 
2001 was about 10 citations a year. Now it is approaching 350 citations a year. So the field is growing. We have to keep a, an eye on the entire field, not just on exactly what we do, because the impacts, uh, uh, you know, is, is enormous, and we have to conduct the field in a responsible manner. Now it all started here, and this is uh, the experiment that we reported uh, uh, in 2000, uh, where we actually were testing all eight forms of natural vitamin E that at the time uh, I had obtained from BASF on a blinded manner, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, S, letter coded and blinded, and we were testing them for their neuroprotective efficacy, and it so turned out that sample C was extremely uh, potent compared to everything else there was. And later on, that sample C uh, turned out to be alpha tocotrienol, which ended up being way more you know, potent than alpha tocopherol. So what you see here is a very simple experiment done a long time back, uh, is glutamic acid, which as you know, is a neurotransmitter, but also found in excess during head trauma or uh, during um, stroke. So if you now challenge neural cells, with glutamic acid, they would all die. And that's no magic, everybody knows that. Now, if you go down this axis, and please note, the concentration here is the nanomolar. Nanomolar is one in a billion, right? Um, I, I do not know any vitamin E functions or any other vitamin functions that actually show effects at nanomolar. And, and we started seeing that 50 nanomolar in a, a, a partial protection 100 nanomolar complete protection, the green bar belongs to tocopherol. So compared to tocopherol, substantial more efficacy of tocotrienol in protecting these neurons. Importantly, if you went and challenged these uh, neural cells with glutamic acid, they would all die in 12 hours after insult. 12 hours, all dead. Now what if you did not treat the cells with tocotrienol before the insult? What if you went and treated after the insult? And we reported that even in this 12-hour time period, if you went in after two and a half hours with one micromolar, you would completely, 100% rescue all the cells that were going to die. So, so this was very striking. Uh, you would think so because now we have put in 14 year worth of work uh, in our numerous uh, papers published, but these were some of the original findings that actually led us to do that. Now, when we took these cells and we were growing them under glutamate treated conditions, of course all those cells were dead, so nothing to count. But now if you had tocotrienol, not only did the cells survive, but as a function of time, 24 hours, 36 hours, they, grow, they grew as if there was no glutamate in the system, uh, showing that this is not a stunted uh, in the life of the cell, that cell biology, cell cycle, so on and so forth, was going on just fine. At the time, you know, Savita was uh, uh, a postdoc in the lab, uh, who is now a faculty. Uh, she did some experiments uh, with the primary fetal cortical neurons and tested a wide range of poison, if you will, uh, glutamic acid, homocysteic acid, uh, glutathione depletion coupled with arachidonic acid. These all have relevance in different types of neuropathologies. Uh, and in all these systems, we were able to note that in the primary neurons, even lower amounts, say 25, you see 50 complete protection here, 50 near complete protection, uh, and, and also here, uh, we were able to see with 100 nanomolar complete protection. So this was something that was not you know, dependent on a given model. Across the system, we saw extremely potent neuroprotective properties. So obviously, we decided that we would move forward and figure out what's the significance of this neuroprotective property. So if you look at this uh, image, which we published in Stroke, the American Heart Association Journal, a few years ago, eight years ago, you know, there are all these primary neurons on the culture plate, and then we injected, we micro-injected one of these neural cells with tocotrienol and Q-dot, Q-dot being the fluorescent tracer, so you know where tocotrienol has been um, injected. And now you treat this uh, plate uh, with a neurotoxin glutamate, you see everything else is dead but this one cell. So it was very, very impressive at the time because you know, when, when in a lab you get to see numerous things uh, in a month, in a year, and, and then you pick a few of those and choose to make that a project which would then uh, dictate what would be happening in the lab for the next 10 years. So I'm sharing with you some of those initial findings which really uh, uh, led us to pause and, and mature this into a full program. So in 2005, in the journal Stroke, American Heart Association, we published the first paper uh, that actually uh, took a trienol 
given orally, not injected, given orally, uh, protects against stroke in spontaneously hypertensive rats. And in these animals, uh, you know, uh, a relatively larger dose of tocotrienol was given. Tocotrienol levels in the brain did go up, and we reported a modest but significant um, uh, protection. That was the first finding, and I should repeat that now there are five different studies in different species of animal all showing the same. This was the first in 2005. In the last eight years, there, there are at least five uh, different studies now uh, from the rat to the mouse to the dog all showing the same thing. So Cameron Rink, who is in the audience, who will speak at the session today, at the time uh, was, uh, I believe, a, a grad student in the lab, uh, and um, you know, he undertook uh, to work with our neuroradiologist, Greg Christopher Reedis, and a whole bunch of imaging experts to develop a model uh, that would allow us to study stroke in canines. Why so? He will tell, uh, speak about that, so I will skip that part. Uh, the relevance of the, uh, of the brain, of the mouse, uh, to human is much less than that of the canine. So we needed some canine data. Long story short, this is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science because we managed to come up with an endovascular, minimally invasive approach. So typically, you know, stroke um, in large animals were performed by taking a piece of the bone out, the cranial window, and go pinch a vessel. You know, I thought, uh, and our group thought, that it was more of a head trauma than stroke because uh, that's not what you usually have in stroke. And some groups took up the eyeball and went and pinched a vessel. We decided to not go either path and decided to come up with our own model, which was essentially create a dime-sized hole in the leg, which Cameron will describe, and then go up endovascular and then actually occlude the mid-cerebral artery uh, where 70% of human stroke takes place. And so that was the model that we reported, I believe, in 2008. And then uh, we put a cohort of dogs um, on a blinded fashion, uh, supplemented or not, in a dog farm. And, and Cameron actually you know, ran that project, so he's the first author of that project. And then several years later, the results came out, and Cameron will talk to you about it, the long story short, being that now we reported, thanks to his work, that it was not only neural protection that I was talking about with all these neural cell studies, but that tocotrienol, after you have a stroke, uh, can actually help revascularize the stroke-affected area. So that was a complete new facet that opened up uh, in our laboratory, uh, drawing even more enthusiasm uh, by the program towards this uh, uh, project. So uh, this is, again, something that you will hear in the session from Cameron, so I only have one slide, essentially showing uh, the stroke-affected area, devastated area, as you see here, uh, and, and that area being revascularized and, and quantitative data on these and mechanistic data on these, uh, you will hear from Dr. Rink in his uh, lecture. Now in 2003, as we were pursuing the different mechanisms by which uh, tocotrienol could function as a neuroprotective agent, I should mention here that so far, and you will see there's a summary slide uh, somewhere in this talk, we have found five molecular checkpoints of neuroprotection by tocotrienol, and interestingly, all five checkpoints were found because of tocotrienol. Those checkpoints were not implicated in stroke or neurodegeneration before we started studying them. It was tocotrienol on one hand that taught us, uh, you know, uh, totally novel uh, pathways of neurodegeneration, which now has been verified by other laboratories to be significantly uh, sort of implicated in stroke biology. So one of those pathways were 12 lipoxygenase. And we reported in 2003, uh, first author of this paper was Dr. Khanna, who is in the audience, uh, demonstrating that 12 lipoxygenase gets specifically inhibited by alpha tocotrienol. So we did in silico studies, we did enzymology studies, and then we did stroke outcome studies. And indeed, then what we reported was if you took 12 lipoxygenase genetically out, then you would have a substantial, as you see here, protection against stroke. This paper came out. Uh, I believe, uh, in 2003, and then there, were, uh, there was the following year came a paper from Harvard showing exactly the same thing also uh, in the American Heart Association Journal of Stroke. So, so this has now led to a complete field of its own where 12 lipoxygenase is being viewed sort of as a key target in stroke therapy. Then came another paper also led by Dr. Khanna, at the time a postdoc in the lab, 
uh, who figured out that uh, not just travel hypoxygenase, but its predecessor, I say predecessor because phospholipase A2 mobilizes arachidonic acid from the membrane for then travel hypoxygenase uh, to uh, metabolize it. So here we demonstrated that uh, alpha tocotrienol also inhibits glutamate-inducible co uh, component of phospholipase A2, and, and therefore uh, that was another uh, sort of mechanistic aspect, which I will all summarize in a summary slide. Then we came up with a paper that Hannah Park, who is now a postdoc in Yale, um, reported. Uh, again, a novel way of how 12 lipoxygenase is turned on in the neural cell during neurodegeneration, and that was by a S glutathionylation process driven by glutathione disulfide within the neural cell. So that was published, I believe, somewhere in 2009. Glutathione disulfide turning on 12 lipoxygenase. So if you now take glutathione disulfide and inject that into the mouse brain, you would see a stroke like infarct as shown here. However, if you did the same to a 12 lipoxygenase knockout mouse, you would see uh, much less because, of course, the, the injection itself will have its own injury, which is shown here. So, so there was a 12 lox uh, sort of sensitive component demonstrating that the GSSG, glutathione disulfide, within the neural cell is key in activating the 12 lipoxygenase pathway. Now, citing our work, now tocotrienol is sold by several vendors. This is just one a data sheet out of many as a neuroprotective agent, so folks can buy it as a neuroprotective agent, and they cite one of our uh, stroke works, but different vendors cite different uh, pieces of our work. Uh, and then if you go to the uh, website of the Stanford Neuroscience Program uh, in California, uh, they actually teach the significance of alpha tocotrienol and 12 locks uh, in the neuroscience program in Stanford. So this is now heading into gradual uh, mainstream, and, and, and we take pleasure and pride in that because, you know, you say something, but for then something to hold over time and to progress towards people is a big pleasure for any laboratory. It's one thing to publish a paper. It's another thing to take that impact to education and to patient. And, and, and this is a painstaking process, and the chances of failure are high because of all the inaccuracies of different experimental systems, but, but we have been able to stick through that process, and, and as I said, we are now in our 13th or 14th year of pursuit. So a more recent paper uh, reported the fourth mechanism. Again, I have a summary slide, so don't worry about the uh, counts, uh, which Hannah Park, just before she left, uh, this was a part of her PhD studies with us, also published in the American Heart Association Journal Stroke, we reported that actually when you get stroke and the neural cells start loading up with glutathione disulfide because of oxidant insult, there is a protein called MRP1, multi-drug resistance protein 1, whose job it is to use ATP and therefore in a pump-like mechanism, efflux or expel all that GSSG from the neural cell into the extracellular um, sort of compartment. And if you don't do that efficiently, then you are going to trap the GSSG within the neural cell, which in turn would turn on the 12 lipoxygenase pathway, and that would then drive the death process. But then in this particular work, we demonstrated that alpha tocotrienol is a potent inducer of MRP1 that helps in the clearance of GSSG uh, from the neural cells in the face of insult, which would be uh, when the neural cells are treated with glutamate or, uh, you know, the brain is being subjected to stroke. So let me summarize some of these processes now. The first uh, mechanism uh, that we showed, was, of course, with glutamate, glutathione levels in the cell go down, and that uh, uh, you know, results in a slight buildup of reactive oxygen species. That reactive oxygen species is enough to turn on C-SARC. C-SARC, as you know, is the Harold Varmus enzyme. Harold Varmus is to be the past director of the NIH, uh, and is all to do with uh, cancer. But this was the first time uh, we actually connected CSARC to neurodegeneration and then came a Nature Medicine paper showing that CSARC is central to stroke outcome. So what we showed was that this inducible CSARC is subject to tocotrienol inhibition. That was the first JBC paper in 2000. Then we showed that this CSARC actually goes and turns on 12 lipoxygenase and that 12 lipoxygenase is inhibited by alpha tocotrienol. That was the second uh, in a target. Then I briefly mentioned that as you insult the cells or you have stroke in vivo, 
you turn on PLA2, phospholipase A2, which mobilizes arachidonic acid from the, me from the membrane into the cytosol, which then serves as a substrate for 12 lap oxygenase, and therefore makes reactive products like 12 heat or 12 HP, which then um, in a contributes to cell death. And we showed that uh, CPLA2 or, or phospholipase A2 is also a target of, uh, 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 of, of alpha tocotrienol. We then showed that in the presence of slight amounts of oxidants, as you see here, uh, glutathione that is residual within the cell will be oxidized, and therefore you would have a buildup of GSSG, or glutathione disulfide. Glutathione disulfide normally uh, would have been recycled into glutathione had there been enough uh, NADPH and uh, glutathione reductase. But you see in a stroke setting, NADPH by oxidation is quickly uh, sort of uh, disappears, and therefore this uh, uh, in a reaction does not take place. So what happens is JSSG is expelled out of the, of the cells uh, through MRP1 into uh, at the extracellular compartment. And that minimizes the JSSG level within the cell and protects the cell, we think. If that was not to happen, then GSSG would be trapped within the cell and would also, through a S-glutathionylation mechanism, turn on 12 lipoxygenase, which would then, again, execute the cell death pathway. Now, uh, we then published, uh, through that stroke paper, that MRP1 is the fourth target of alpha tocotrienol Talk about rational drug design. This is a very, very interesting natural design with, for which we take no credit, but we are only elucidating all the multiple areas in which this particular, uh, I shouldn't say drug, but almost like a drug works. So most recently, 2013, two weeks ago, we now published the fifth mechanism showing that a downstream product of 12 lipoxygenase helps kill microRNA-29 and that this microRNA is neuroprotective and we have in our neural cells, and this gets degraded, and that tocotrienol rescues microRNA-29 from degradation in a dying neural cell. So what are all these microRNA? Just a quick introduction, because this is the first time we are connecting tocotrienol to microRNA. As you know, the Human Genome Project uh, was solved ahead of time, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we came up with a complete panel of all protein coding genes, and we thought we have now cracked the human genome code, and now we will solve all genetic disease, so on and so forth. Didn't quite happen because it was not that simple, because God had a different plan. Uh, once you uncoded the uh, human genome code, it seemed we really did not have a grip of what the human genome did. So where was a the disconnect? There was a disconnect, uh, at least one of which were, was then caught uh, in 1999. And this is a fascinating story. I know the topic of my talk is not microRNA, so I will uh, show you two or three slides. Dr. Khanna will talk more about it. MicroRNAs were discovered in 1999, got the Nobel Prize in 2006, and FDA-approved drug 2009 very, very fast from, from discovery, man, mankind knows. So what is this fascinating pathway? Just very quickly, because now we have connected tocotrienols to microRNA, it falls on me to tell you what this is all about. So you know, 98% or so of the human genome does not encode any protein, and we called it junk DNA for a long time because it did not encode protein, so why should we worry about it? Now we know that a small fraction of that non-coding gene family is represented by these microRNA, and what this microRNA do is through sequence complementarity, as you see here, binds to genes and tells if a gene should make a protein or not. So in other words, we have about 1,100 or so microRNAs controlling about 15 to 20,000 human genes. So each microRNA regulates, roughly speaking, a dozen different coding genes, meaning that if you really knew uh, which microRNA should be targeted, you then would successfully manipulate a dozen different coding genes, which all convergently function uh, towards a common biological outcome. So what you see here is that, uh, so this pathway is called protein in a post-transcriptional gene silencing. The, post the entire field of post-transcriptional gene silencing opened up uh, because uh, of this microRNA. And the beauty, as I said, is each microRNA silences a number of coding genes. And, and microRNA-29, by the way, uh, we now know, silences a whole family of coding genes that execute the death process 
uh, in the neural cells. And now tocotrienol rescues from the disappearance of that microRNA-29. So stay tuned for the talk to be delivered by Dr. Khanna. I will not steal her thunder, but uh, we in the lab really are dedicated. Uh, we have been working on microRNAs now for eight years. We have been publishing on it for eight years and with a key emphasis on ischemic disease. And therefore, uh, you know, our, our main interest is in the area of oxygen-sensitive microRNA or hypoxia-inducible microRNA, oximeres as we have named it. Uh, and this is one of the recent articles that came out uh, a, a few weeks ago in the seminars of Cell and Developmental Biology. As I said, microRNAs have now gone into the clinical trials. Uh, they have gone orphan drug uh, status, and, and in a moment time is very high. As you will see, numerous, all the big companies are now jumping into microRNA. Billions of dollars are in play. It is not the focus of the talk, so I will not get into the details of that. Just Google yourself up and or look at the scientific literature. You will see that the microRNA field is rapidly exp exp exploding. So this work that we just reported a couple of weeks ago, which Dr. Khanna will describe, connects for the first time uh, tocotrienols to microRNA. In this case, this is microRNA-29. I'm sure this is one of many microRNA that will be discovered over time. And we believe this is a key new frontier that will not only provide solutions in the stroke arena, but also in the arena of other diseases. So I encourage all of you to take a look. Now, as you know, for a long time, the tocotrienol field has been in a state of hiatus because of a debate in the scientific community uh, the fact that if you took tocotrienol orally, it does not get into your uh, tissues. You know, uh, so somebody claimed that you know, TTP, tocopherol transfer protein, does not uh, you know, carry tocotrienol efficiently, so what's the point of eating it? We came and sh we took those tocotrienol deficient mice, we published uh, two papers on that, demonstrating, so there were two, paper, two mice generated, one in Japan, one in San Francisco, where TTP was made knockout, so vitamin E could not be transported in these mice, and we reported that indeed in those mice that lack TTP, we can transport tocotrienol into tissues, demonstrating that tocotrienol is transported by a TTP independent mechanism. And by the way, all those mice that did not have TTP lost fertility. Of course, tocosferolos, loss of fertility, they lost fertility. By giving tocotrienol, we restored fertility in those TTP knockouts. Out in the literature, I'll not discuss about that. Fast forward, we undertook a study on, on, on people where we actually gave tocotrienol to people for three to five years. And we are, were taking their heart, their liver, their brain, their lung, uh, all these organs from live people. And, and we completed the study. It took us five years. And then we reported in the Journal of Nutrition that all of these vital organs that I just mentioned did receive tocotrienol if you give those people orally. So the, all these people that we targeted were suffering from an end-stage uh, organ failure, uh, you know, sort of diseases. So organs had to come out of these people. So we gave them tocotrienol, and then essentially we proved that taken orally in humans, tocotrienol does go, and thanks to MPOB, this work was largely supported by the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. So thank you very much. As you see, a large group of people, because many, many surgeons were involved in the study, so that uh, it was a patient-based study. Now, something new came out of the study, which I shared uh, with MPOB during my progress report times, and now it seems to have uh, caught fire. Uh, uh, and so maybe a couple of words on that. So we had two groups in this uh, study with 140 people. Uh, one was surgical patient, you know, uh, that we would collect these, and then these were healthy subjects from which you would take skin biopsy, blood, so on and so forth. And there was a unique observation that our liver transplant surgeons made, which is when these people were supplemented with tocopherol, that was the control group, by the way, uh, or tocovid superbio, which was the tocotrienol carrying capsule that we gave to these people, uh, uh, you know, we made uh, an interesting observation. What was the observation? Before we get into the observation, we need to understand what is a MELT score. So the MELT score essentially is a biochemical index that tells you uh, how bad is the liver condition. So if I were to go for liver transplantation and my MELT score is above, uh, you know, say 20 uh, or, or, or 30, uh, they would immediately prioritize my transplantation because otherwise I'm going to die uh, within three months. You know, see, the three-month mortality is very high. But if you are below that, that level, then, of course, uh, you are triaged. You are it, it pushed down on priority for a liver transplantation. So what we observe is those people, uh, look at the time scale here, 2006 in you know, September or so, and this is like November of 2007, so we are talking about long-term follow-up. You know, so what we started is people usually 
that have this type of bad liver, uh, MELT scores go up over time. Now, those folks that were on tocotrienol, tocovid supervio, and the control, remind you, were not placebo, uh, some, some uh, vitamin E free gel. This was tocopherol as the control. So when we did that, we figured out that folks that took uh, the control had this type of a trajectory that is uh, in a well accepted, that it goes sort of exp exponentially up, and then you are sort of uh, in, in very bad territory. But in, if you took Tokovic Superbio, it is significantly sort of dampened. That elevation of MELD is significantly uh, dampened. So we concluded when all patients are considered, those who are supplemented with tocovid superbio had a significantly lower MELD score slope than those supplemented with tocopherol. So essentially, uh, this was a very interesting finding, but that was not the design of the study. The study design was to see if the tocotrienol went to uh, the liver. So of course, that was the reason we did the study. So it was sort of uh, 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 not a prospective study on a liver trial. So we are now planning in those directions. So what I say here is that, you, know, not, uh, you see, much of the world really does not have the privilege of receiving a liver transplantation. And you know how rampant liver diseases are uh, in all aspects of liver disease. So this could be the hope to a lot of people to have or restore their liver function. Of course, we are not claiming that liver uh, is renewed by taking tocotrienol. All we are saying is the progression of the pathology is sharply blunted. So for those of us who are privileged uh, to have the opportunity of a liver transplantation, we are buying ourselves more time to wait for the liver. For the rest of the world that have no hope in getting a new liver into themselves, you know, this is a, you're buying more time for your life. So this is actually a huge market for which uh, in there should be a more sort of sensitivity. And I believe there is a liver presentation also at this uh, meeting. And if you look also at uh, the overall uh, scope, you know, this is uh, thousands of millions, so essentially this is billions. It's a very large market. So this really needs to be seen um, you know, uh, seriously. Although our intent was to study stroke, this is something that we stumbled upon, but uh, we cannot choose to ignore. So there is a proposal, uh, thanks to MPOB and thanks to its leader, uh, 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 the DG uh, Chu. Uh, there is a proposal that is uh, being processed, and we look forward to hearing about that soon. As soon as we, that is done, we'll start enrolling, and we should be able uh, to be on our way for a, for a significant liver trial. Now, with that, I'll change gears and go to the uh, last part of my talk, which is back to stroke. Okay? So, and, I, and I spoke about secondary prevention. I would like to come back to that. So what did I mean by secondary prevention? So please note here, uh, mortality of stroke, 19 to 25% in one month after stroke. I'm not dead yet uh, because I still have a month to live before I die. So there is an opportunity for secondary prevention. 10% per year thereafter. Uh, 75 to 81% survive. Two-thirds of the survivors are independent. And then 9% will have a recurrent stroke in six months and 22% will have a recurrent stroke by five years. So here's the population where the time is ticking towards another big devastating episode of stroke, and that's where the opportunity for secondary intervention comes. If you look at uh, the secondary intervention, you should first understand what is a mini stroke. So a mini stroke, also known as a transient ischemic attack, is a small stroke where the blood uh, flow blockade was temporary, and therefore the impact was not as devastating as in a full stroke. Nonetheless, you lost a little bit of your tissue, but more importantly, it gave us the clue that you are at extreme high risk for having another stroke. So to target those people would be great, uh, because if you can now prevent that second stroke and therefore death or disability, that's a big uh, intervention opportunity. If you look at the real numbers as published in JAMA, you see that there is a 10.5% of stroke occurrence. And we're not talking years and years. We're talking 90 days after TIA. So you have a beautiful window after stroke that you can really watch carefully as to the, what the outcome is. And can you change it with a given intervention? This is not a 5-year, 10-year, 20-year study. A very, very tight intervention window. And if you look at all other adverse effects, not just stroke, because if you have stroke, you're also at a higher risk to have not only stroke, but other cardiovascular events in hospitalization, death, or recurrent TIA, so on and so forth. If you look at a more objective scale, there are actual scales. You know, the scale is seven can be the max. You know, you get a point if you're above 60. You get a point if you have more than 140 in a systolic. You get two points for a unilateral weakness, so on and so forth. 
So if you do stratify and have patients, you know, uh, sort of stratified by this point system, folks that are in six to seven, uh, uh, you know, will have the 90-day risk for uh, another stroke is like 20%. So one out of five people is going to have, and you can stratify them. These are all prospectively stratifiable. So this is not about, this is a huge opportunity for secondary in intervention, and obviously the world recognized that, and therefore you have, uh, you, you know, American Heart Association, American Stroke Association making specific recommendations, which I will come to shortly, but a very interesting component of the secondary prevention is antiplatelet therapy. So essentially, any which way you slice, antiplatelet therapy, the control here is on the right side, by the way, uh, in, in this particular British uh, medical journal publication, the green bars of the control. So you see protection, 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 all through antiplatelet function. So it looks like there's a lot of confidence in antiplatelet therapy. If you therefore go to American Heart Association, American Stroke Association recommendation, antiplatelet anti therapy is a big emphasis in secondary prevention. So why am I saying all of this? I'll come to that shortly. So if you compare aspirin, which is now a big deal, as you know, in cardiovascular prevention, uh, with Plavix, you see an 8.7% uh, benefit, which may seem to you marginal, but that has launched the entire Plavix field. I mean, I mean it's used worldwide. So, so this is a huge impact in the CVD disease uh, arena, uh, even to have a slight impact like that. So aspirin, or baby aspirin as we call it, because it is taken at a lower dose, has become you know, common all over the world, and, and Bayer is reporting in 2007 over $1.1 billion sales of aspirin for the purposes of secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Huge market for aspirin, okay? But if we you know, put some more effort there, we will find that aspirin has risk factors. Not to say that it is not good, of course it is good, but we also have to be mindful of the fact that there are risk factors, there is GI bleeding, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, there is also the thing that platelets, as you know, has a half-life of 7 to 10 days, depending on who you ask. Okay? This means that every day, one-seventh or one-tenth of your platelets are new, meaning that if you don't take aspirin uh, for the next day or 48 hours, you will end up having new platelets that does not have aspirin memory, and now you have... Uh, you know, reconstituted their ability to form a clot. So you see how quickly the aspirin effect dies. In day three, boom, it's gone. So now you're making clot again if you forgot, if you're traveling, or, or just you, you forgot to take. So keep that in context because I'm going to show you some data so that will need you to recall this, uh, you know, evidence. So platelet, some GI bleeding and other toxicities very quickly loses effect. How does platelet work? It works via the arachidonic acid pathway. I'll not get into further details for the sake of this uh, talk, but just remember it works on the arachidonic acid pathway, of course, prevents thromboxin A2 formation. Now, I'll leave it there and recall that memory now when I show you our data. So this was, uh, you know, thanks to MPOB and thanks to Pemandu. This was a clinical trial that was funded uh, about uh, almost two years ago now, and it has a phase one component and a phase two component. And, and we have enrolled now uh, 84 patients. Cameron updated me this morning. 84 patients in this trial, you know, 73 in a given phase and, 70, and 11 in another phase. Now, as a part of this trial, I'm not ready to give you the results of the trial because it's ongoing. So I'll stop uh, in talking about the trial itself. But let me share with you some of the findings now. So as a part of the trial now, in an in a arm of the uh, trial that has now done 73 patients, not 1, 2, 3, 10, 73 patients, uh, we have been looking at platelet aggregation in folks that receive tocovid superbio, and essentially uh, we use arachidonic acid as an agonist in this particular case, and essentially what you're measuring is uh, clotted pla platelets, as you see here. Okay, so here uh, it is not yet uh, aggregated, and here it is uh, uh, aggregated and resembling a clot. Now please bear with me and look at this. So here you see is the arachidonic acid pathway, right? That's the placebo. Look how the aggregation is happening. Now, this is 62 days after the person has received tocovid superbio. 62 days, two months of uh, tocovid superbio. Complete switch off of platelet aggregation. This is a drug-like effect. This is not 10%, 15%, 20%. Complete, 100% switch off. Now you see two days post-supplementation when you expect to lose aspirin effect. This is not that I have presented ever, anywhere. So this is the first time I'm presenting this. So, so two days, you would start seeing to lose 
100% flat in political aggregation. If you now look at five days post, 100% flat. I'll explain why. Ten days post, so no more supplementation for ten days. 100% flat, 100%. 20 days post comes back. Okay? Long story short, we have now evidence that once you take for these two months, tocotrienol is loading up in your sub-Q fat, and you have a time release from your fat into the blood. And, and so talk about in a multi-targeted drugs, uh, targeting different pathways, that's uh, the future. There are lots of issues with drug-drug interaction, amount of pills, so on and so forth. I, I will quickly sort of speed up in these last couple of slides. So you see, this is uh, a strategy slide for stroke therapeutics, not made up by me. This is made up by the key experts in the stroke therapy area, and they believe that an ideal stroke drug would have the following properties. One is that prevention and treatment of complication. We believe tocotrienol scores here because of the antithrombotic effects. Cytoprotective strategies aimed at cellular metabolic target. We already have published uh, you know, numerous papers on that. Reperfusion strategies. So we now just published this uh, you know, irrigation of the post-stroke tissue that Dr. Rink will talk to you about. And inhibition or modulation of the inflammatory process. Also, we have evidence, we already have published, that post-stroke neuroinflammation is remarkably subdued. And Dr. Rink will address that uh, by tocotrienol. So tocotrienol, interestingly, by no design of ours, seem to match all these properties. My last slide here. So we believe uh, there is a potential. Of course, uh, we are sort of cautious here in making these statements. Um, a multi-targeted solution, uh, antithrombotic, that would be more on the preventive side. A neuroprotective, uh, you already saw that, I shared some data with you, and arteriogenic that Dr. Rink will today address. And all of these taken together launches pump tocotrienol as a very, very unique non-drug solution. Of course, it can be also cultivated via the drug pathway, but that's a separate story. With that, I would like to uh, come to my uh, general recommendation slides. You know, this being a key sponsor of tocotrienol research throughout the world, now, please focus on human clinical findings and then go back to animals to study mechanism. Keeping on studying animals for the sake of animals, uh, in my opinion, has not been very effective. If I saw something in the human and then went and asked how in the animal, makes sense. But, but animal for the sake of animals you know, will not take us very far. Emphasis on branding based on level of scientific evidence. It is not okay, in my opinion, to claim Dr. Ryan also good at this and good at that. Weigh out the evidence. See where they all Put a score on them. In, in certain indications, you will see the score is like 9 out of 10. In other indications, maybe it is 2 out of 10. So we need to hold back in, in claims as we, as we make those conclusions. In a small-scale clinical trials are warranted, uh, ours being one of them, I'm sure several others going on. And those, depending on outcomes, should be matured into large-scale clinical trials, multi-center, 10,000 people. Unless we go down that path, we are not going to really get the, to get the respect of the broader community. And I think tocotrienols have all the arsenal. Uh, it's just that how we project it. And finally, you know, there is a momentum now. If you look at how the literature is, we need to strike. We cannot afford delays with that. I would like to, I would like to thank the sponsors and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sundram. Uh, I'd like to open it to the floor. Any questions? If you'd like to ask, please state your name and the organization that you work for. Yes, please. Please use the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. My name is uh, Dr. Ekochin Fintan. I work for the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital.